and welcome to the Lobcast podcast, Mixers and Marketing. I'm Stephanie Donaldson, your hostess with the Marketing Mostess, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Pini Yakowell, co-founder and CEO of Optimove. Pini, do you mind introducing yourself to our listeners? First of all, hello, Stephanie. Thank you for having me. And yes, I'm Pini Yakowell. I'm the founder and CEO of Optimove. Nice to be here. And I'm calling you today from Tel Aviv, Israel. Well, thank you for joining us. And listeners, if you want to make the complimentary cocktail for this episode, which is an apple teeny, mine turned out pretty vibrant, but <laughs> you're going to need one and a half ounces of apple vodka, 0.75 ounces of fresh lemon juice, and 0.75 ounces of simple syrup. You're going to combine the ingredients in a cocktail shaker that's been filled with ice, shake, and then strain into a chilled cocktail glass. So cheers and welcome to the show, Peeny. Thank you. I wish I had one of those myself. <laughs> Great way to end the day or start the day wherever we are in the world. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to be talking about a topic that's on many marketers' minds, AI. Some marketers are eager to embrace the technology, and some are kind of waiting to integrate AI into their marketing tech stack. So Pini, Optimove has been here for more than a decade. When did you guys first start using AI in your platform and your solutions? We started from the get-go, essentially. Optimum was founded by uh, myself and, at the time, uh, one of my friends from academia. So we were both researching machine learning and AI uh, at university. He had a PhD, and I was the dumb guy with a master's, <laughs> with a master's degree. Uh, and, yeah, that's how we started. So we went out to the world. There's, like, two, two data geeks that are looking to basically harness the models that we've learned to real-life problems. And we landed, uh, we landed at retention marketing. So kind of like uh, helping brands maximize the value of their existing customers by leveraging, you know, data and machine learning to understand the customers better. And then to action that with uh, more personalized and relevant messages across all the channels. And, you know, that's who we are. We like to say that we are the, the first uh, customer-led marketing platform. Mm. So that's, that's Optimum in a nutshell. And today it's 450 people across uh, New York, London, Tel Aviv, and recently partnered with Summit Partners, which is our mm. main investors from Boston. And, and yeah, excited to be on this journey. And, you know, it's my first job. So out of uni doing this, and I can proudly say that I was the one forging Optimove over the years and vice versa. I think the company helped me become who I am today. Well, that's excellent. And I mean, I think as mar as a marketer myself, we're always looking for ways to personalize our marketing messages because that's really what it's all about, making sure that you're delivering that right message at the right time to the right customer. And you need that data to not only deliver that message, but make sure that it's personalized and relevant to the person. We can all spot a generic offer from 10 miles away. Exactly. Exactly. And I think you know, as you know, there's a lot of cultural references, right? Minority Report with Tom Cruise come to mind. And, uh, but, you know, the, the beginning, like people never did it. It was just too expensive and too difficult to do it, right? Yeah. So I like to go back to Henry Ford with the T model. And like he said, you can paint it any color you want as long as it's black. So it's like, <laughs> I'm not dealing with that thing, right? I'm giving, I'm making all of my cars black. And it's like zero percent, not even paint. Right. And at time, you know, technology improved and you got, you know, the the development of the assembly line and robotics mm -hmm. and how you how they assemble cars. And today uh, you can order your whatever Mercedes or Audi Q7 with like 50 different types of wheels or, or rims <laughs> or, or, you know, steering wheel or different. Panels. Whatever so, color you want it to be. <laughs> oh, you can even design your own Nike shoes, right, with your own. So. And as it comes to marketing, we we empower uh, our users to basically delight their customers with the most relevant message and personalized message to the customer. So since you've been in this journey for a long time, how have you seen the role of AI in marketing evolve? I think obviously like around when when did the big blow up of open AI happen and jet GPT is it like six months ago? Probably five months Probably. ago. Everyone's an expert. <laughs> I, definitely since then, you know, you can see a step function. So I think mm. like uh, there's always like a very, you know, there's always been like small gradual improvements. 
Uh, but I think there's a few major step functions, right? So I think uh, the first one is probably the democratization of computing, right? So before, mm. before, be because those things require a lot of uh, a lot of compute power, right? So yeah. if, even if I, I think the math was there for a long time, right? So uh, of course the math is getting better as well, right? So what you the math is is improving as well, but if you actually think about it, even at the before ChatGPT and stuff like that, in my company and in and in companies similar to mine. Typically, the biggest challenge to actually run machine learning models was what you call ML ops, mm. right? So, the operation of of data and computers that requires to ship out a predictive model into production mm. or a machine learning model into production. And at the beginning, only client, only you know, the huge companies like Netflix and Google and and Facebook, like. These are the, and Amazon, of course, and Microsoft, like these are the type of behemoths that actually enjoyed a very strong computing infrastructure, what namely then after became, you know, AWS and GCP mm -hmm. and Azure and all of those. Now they're actually selling it. So cloud computing is a big part. So that was definitely a step function. And now then companies needed to build a proper ML ops infrastructure to support that. Uh, but then ChatGPT is indeed a step function, 100%. Um, yeah, also, you know, you, you know, bring me back. I, I tend to go on tangents, so just talk <laughs> whatever you can. No worries. I love listening to what you have to say about it. I mean, I, it's a very new topic. It's something that even, I'll admit, I've been hesitant about because at my core, I'm a content marketing manager. I'm a writer, and seeing these machines oh. coming in to take my job, I'm like, um, but, but I like doing the writing. <laughs> yes, that's it. That, yeah, for you. I'm actually not that great at writing, so I actually <laughs> love it. <laughs> Don't can, worry, like, you're in good up. company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Uh, but I think, I think. look, we, we, it's, it's important to understand that, you know, mostly what we see, like the, the big step function that happened now, it's mostly about uh, large language models or how they call them, LLMs. And, and basically pictures, right? So mm. AI right now, so basically it can understand language, you know, you can chat with it and it's really smart and, and you know, it can write things on it. So, so kind of like writing has been decoded, right? Cracked. Mm. So the machines can write, right? That, that's a big change. Uh, but mostly it's, it's around language. A lot of the, a lot of the, the improvement is about language, uh, but also about kind of like more than that, automation and, and things you can do and how you can take language and then perform a sequence of automated tasks because of language and, and of course uh, and of course pictures but I think from our perspective we usually use machine learning mostly to analyze data and, sure. and that part is also has greatly improved but I think it's fair to say that uh, this big step function is is mostly on, on language and pictures I would say Definitely. And I think, you know, I haven't been on any marketing team in my entire career where I've come on board and they're like, our data is perfect. It's 100% clean. And so that's another big part of AI. It's if it's garbage in, it's garbage out. So you still have to have that human component of making sure that your data is clean. It works. And that way you're going to get the outcomes that you expect. But going back to your own company, Optimove, how far are you planning on taking AI in your platform and solutions? Do you guys have a roadmap for that? I think, I think the question is not how far you take AI, right? AI eventually is a tool. It, it's now a, probably a more powerful tool in your arsenal. Mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately, the question is, can it help you to realize your vision? Um, and we've always had, you know, problems that we wanted to solve, right? So, for example, for us, uh, we are excited about whether I can have like this big search box within Optimum mm. and because we, we host a lot of data sure. and we, we transform this data into a very friendly form for the market. Mm. So marketers don't need to know SQL or stuff like that to gain really deep insights from their data inside Optimum, but they still need to push a few buttons and <laughs> uh, go into this dashboard and filter this or that and, you know, click this or that. Imagine if they could say, hey, 
you know, what's been my best performing segment mm. in July 2021 and why? Mm. Right? Yeah. So let's say, so, and then they just get an answer with a nice little chart. And so this idea of just being able to ask a, ask a questions and get, when you sit on top of such rich data mm -hmm. and then just, you know, have any answer that you want to, to get, you know, the speed from, you know, question to insights, I think becomes much, much shorter, right? right. And so that's what I'm excited about. Some people are excited about innovation in UX, right? So many people just saw like what Shopify did, right? And they're saying that they're going to be releasing a new AI assistant inside mm -hmm. Shopify. So, so it's mostly like having, a, you know, a, like, like a butler, right? So I'm sorry, I'm a big Seinfeld buff. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm going to use the word instead, instead of a sidekick, but it's kind of like you have your own and you say, hey, just take the homepage and change it from, you know, mostly focusing on jackets to focus on, you know, pants or something mm -hmm. like that. And then, so a lot of those tasks that you can do, but then you need to learn how to do them. You need to learn the platform, know which buttons you need to press within a specific UI, understand how to walk the UI. Now, basically with a prompt, you can just say, do this and this and this, you know, and just chat with that AI. And then all of those tasks will be automatically performed. So in a way, like if you think about the future, maybe systems no longer have a UI with like a menu mm. and uh, check boxes and forms and, you know, wizards that you fill out things and it takes you to a place. You can just, you know, chat to a prompt and those mm. things will just happen. So maybe in the future, you know, all UIs just look like Google. Yeah. That's a future I'm interested in as a marketer. <laughs> yeah, th th this this is definitely because there's already, you know, HubSpot have been doing some things around that that you can basically just search and it would do some things for you. I mean, I think it's the same questions like would you would the user prefer to because even when you prompt you need to you need to provide all the details, right? Yes. So would you rather provide all the details in natural language? Or would you rather just go over the because like a form, for example, it tells you it's like a checklist of everything you need to you need to. But then the the check can come back and say, yeah, you missed those two. What are they? And then you can answer. So uh, I don't know, but that's a that's an interesting thing that will happen. I think around UX. Um, I'm more I'm more interested in using it for data and for insights, as I said before. This is my and obviously other things that like people have done before. Around, like even in the space of marketing, you know, uh, people that have been using AI for better copywriting, right? So you yep. you had those use you had those use cases that you can, for example, you know, generate more alternatives for a subject line in an email, or yep. more alternative for a copy like a, a, the main sentence in a banner. Mm -hmm. So think about AI generating like you just give it the first one, and then it's generating like ten more alternatives. Yep, and in the back end is going to be testing all of those 10 and find the best one for your audience. So I love that. We actually have a blog post on our own website talking about, should I use chat GPT to write my direct mail marketing copy? And we kind of hedge our bets and say like, maybe do some, you know, like just copy tests. Like you're going to run an AB test split of this postcard campaign. Here's your header over here. Now generate me a couple different examples. And then we're going to move that over there after giving it a review to make sure that the sentence actually reads correctly. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. I don't think, I, I think like if you, if you think about it, those things probably get better, but, but I do agree with you that at the end of the day, I, you know, I think the way to look at AI is ultimately, you know, it's, it's a very old cliche, but I'll still use it because I think it's very relevant. I think like from a broad perspective, we, you should think about the human. So when, when I was learning like big sci-fi things and, you know, Isaac Asimov and all of those books about the future and which are now becoming very relevant, mm. it's always about the machine don't know how to ask a question. Mm. The machine don't know how to design an experiment, right? Uh, so those things are things that like humans still do better. And if you think about, if you think about like you say, okay, the human, the, the human user needs to define like the playground or the framework. Like this is where things are happening. This is what you're now 
task to do. And within that, please optimize. So yeah. you want the machine, the, the machine to optimize, right? So because machines can run, you know, a lot of permutations and a lot of calculations that are very hard for humans to do. But yeah. humans can, we can use our narrative driven brain to which this is something that we are the, that's what we do. That's how we do that. It's about, you know, in, in, a, in the shape of a narrative. And then we can design an experiment or ask a good question. Or, so it's, it's kind of like, who can, who can create better prompts to chat GPT? Maybe that's the skill of the future, right? Uh, yeah. or, or things like that. It, what will determine it. And I think a fun example is, you know, they always talk about Terminator versus Iron Man, right? So is it, are the machines going to be like Terminator or is it like Iron Man, right? So hopefully on the good side of things, it's like Iron Man. So it's like a suit you put on. It just basically enhances your abilities mm-hmm. and not something that's trying to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope not. I don't I don't want to go battle with some robots, but since we're already kind of talking about finding that perfect harmonious balance between AI and human in marketing, are there any things that marketers should be wary of when implementing AI like on their own or with the providers that they're choosing in their MarTech stack? Hmm. Um, I mean, worrying, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, it's not usually how I do life. It's like, what are the cautions? I'm, I'm a, mm-hmm. I think, you know, you, you need to be basically moderated, right? So anything you do, sure. just kind of like study it, be curious, research it, you know, take some baby steps, kind of like see how it works you know, go deeper in, be open mm-hmm. to it. I mean, we don't want to be the taxi driver that thinks it like he knows better than ways. Yeah. I think that's like, we don't want to be that, right? At the same time, we want, we probably, so we probably don't want to go to say like, oh, I'm going to replace my entire department with AI within six months. That's probably too much to the other side. So tr- start experimenting, you know, take your problems, take your use cases, take some courses, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I'm, I'm using ChatGPT myself and hmm. uh, being Israeli with, with the, you know, janky English, it's, uh, it's definitely a benefit. So, so, you know, uh, but just be open and try it and, and see what it, I think always being open and, and not being closed off and, and fearful. I think that's a better approach for every marketer uh, because you got to get, you got to be a part of it, right? You don't want to be left behind so probably can enhance what you can do and if you are building your skill set and you'll continue to be creative there's definitely you know no problem and no risk for you yeah what about the flip side of that is there a minimum use of ai that marketers should be using right now to stay competitive in their industries um depends on on the i i probably i i wonder what like you know like content factories are probably mm. the ones that are very much you know uh, using it and trying it probably more probably junior level more i would assume that like savvy content marketer that be writing for many years like you know, so I, you know i'm gonna spend more time editing it than actually writing it myself right so yep but but yeah, I think everybody should be open for it because indeed there is a step function. Mm-hmm. You can't uh, ignore that. Like there is a step function. That's why everybody's so hyped. You know, there's millions of people tried it and they all posted on LinkedIn, like, see how amazing, you know, it solved this and this for me. And it created, like people are impressed. So yeah, it's, and it's always getting better, right? So it's getting better and better by, by, by the week, I think. So I think definitely just being open to it exploring it, experimenting, and uh, and see where it takes you. I love that. All right, we already kind of talked about personalization earlier because we know as marketers that personalization is so important. In fact, in our recent 2023 State of Direct Mail Consumer Insights report, it shows that personalization continues to be a key element for marketing success in direct mail. Our report shows that 68% of consumers are more likely to engage with a message or communication from brands that are personalized to them. So we all know personalization has come a long way in marketing, but Pini, how does AI play a role? Do you think AI can truly deliver real-time personalization in our marketing campaigns? 
Uh, yes, 100%. I think uh, a lot of it is already happening. So uh, obviously AI is, it helps us to know our customers better, number one. So by leveraging all the data that we can collect and gather on our customers, right? Uh, first party data, so everything we know as a brand, zero parting data, if our mm -hmm. customers give us this data, right? Just fill out forms. And, and if we can get third party or data from somebody else, at the end of the day, AI is, the, so this is what we do at Opti, where we analyze the data and we put it in a, in a specific structure that, mm -hmm. it, you know, discovers interesting personas of customers, right? So if I'm looking at this, this huge database and I'm trying to make sense of it, I don't want to be asking a question and how many people did this and this and how many people bought more than this and how many people uh, like this product how many, i want the ai to tell me hey this is an archetype of customers that you have in your database right so you have and it's and it's coming out like something that maybe in the past you, you needed to hire a mckinsey consultant to run a project of, of 18 months and do focus groups and panels and things like that Maybe you can get those archetypes with AI much, much faster. Of mm. course, panels makes it relevant because uh, you get different type of data there. But so this is something that's already happening. Uh, speaking of, uh, you know, giving it in real time. So exactly the example we used before, right? So if, if I'm a, another thing that we use AI to do. So if I'm basically testing out a few alternatives for a marketing campaign, I can have uh, A, B, and C, and mm -hmm. usually how people used to do it, you run A, B, and C, and A, B, and C, and you look for the winner. So you say the winner of this campaign is is permutation A. So mm -hmm. now let's deploy permutation A for the entire segment. And what we do instead, and have been doing for a while, we have this thing called a self-optimized campaign, where we are basically deploying A, B, and C, but then we study the winner per micro segment, not per mm -hmm. the entire thing. So okay. that even the losing, even the losing action, let's say you have one of the variants of the campaign is by far the worst performing when you test it on the entire big segment. Mm -hmm. But but you have four micro segments that love it. So that's what they should see. Yeah. Right. That's that's personalization. So again, you we use this approach called contextual ba uh, contextual bandit to uh, essentially solve this problem, and we leverage all the deep data that we have in Optimum, the micro segments and things like that, to be able to to do that uh, and to close the loop with all of the machine learning ops and and the things you need to do. So ultimately, and those things are already happening, uh, and I think in the future. Some other things that we're looking at, like whether the style of writing will impact mm -hmm. your propensity to engage. For example, oh, yeah. I don't know, Stephanie, if you, let's say you have a brand that you really like to buy from. Mm -hmm. Of course, that brand has a specific voice, right? So some brands have a specific voice. But yeah. can they have a few permutations to that voice, right? Is it legit that you will get a message that's basically more clean and formal? And I'm going to get a message that's maybe more whimsical and humoristic. Now, yeah. the, land, the, the, the overarching message of that campaign read the same, right? They're going to tell you and me that there's a new product line and we both get a discount if we buy it by Friday. Mm -hmm. But yours is, going, yours is going to be more formal and mine is going to be more, or maybe mine is going to be New York style and yours is going to be Boston style in the copy. <laughs> like, Will that work? I don't know. Maybe some research shows that it does. Oh yeah. So now it's very that's very easy to do now. No, and I've done that before, you know, again, being in content marketing, you really have to understand how the style, your voice, your tone, it kind of can change the message a little bit and how the person perceives it and what they take action on, especially on a per campaign basis. Since we just kind of talked about personalization in real time, let's say through a specific campaign, what about bigger marketing strategies? Do you think that AI is able to make strategic marketing decisions? I do not. Okay. <laughs> I do not. No, no, I mean, I think strategic decisions require semantic knowledge of the world and, and your specific business and your specific goals, which I think it's not 
not yet, right? Maybe, maybe yeah. that's maybe the maybe the next step function, right? Maybe ten years, fifteen, twenty, for thirty. I don't know, but no, this strategic decision. Of course, it can help inform the decision, right? And sure. uh, and guide the decision, but the decision and the strategy will be done by a, you know a, a set of molecules called a human. No, and I think that's a very fair answer, right? You. A machine is just making decisions based, again, on the data sets that you've given it. So it understands, okay, if this, then that, and moving through. Whereas a human, yes, we are still doing that essentially, but we're able to bring that historical context. We're able to see the bigger picture. We know things that the computer doesn't. And I agree. I think that we should definitely be in charge of it coming up with a strategy. But then when it comes down to kind of those campaigns, allowing the AI to do what it do what it does best and using that data to make those real-time personalizations, to make that change, to saying, oh, hey, you know, John John Smith in New York needs to get this version of the campaign instead because we've seen him take actions on ones like it before. Exactly. All right. So, Pini, what advice would you give to marketers who are looking to leverage AI in their marketing efforts but are kind of worried about relinquishing control? Yeah, that's a... Yeah, I think that the control piece is, is actually pretty big. Uh, it's funny, like we find that, uh, maybe I'll answer with, with a simple, uh, like with, with an example or a story from our user, user base. So let's say if we have a user base that's been, we have a client that's been, that client has been using Optimum for four years, right? Mm -hmm. And they, they have a few habits, right? So they're used to doing something. So for example, we had a process of decisioning and that process is manual. So the user needs to choose in the GUI. They need to say, I want this to happen before that, stuff like that. Now we're going to release a new AI feature that takes this manual process and makes it automatic, right? So AI will make the decision for you. So the users that are used to the system and, use, and have been using the manual process for like two, three years, they will not adopt a new AI feature, mm -hmm. okay? But a client that just onboarded a month ago, they don't even know that we had the feature of doing it manually. So for them, when they get started, for them, okay, fine. So this is one more thing I just don't need to worry about. So because it's automatically provided to them that that decision is taken by the machine, they adopt it much more. Yeah. So I think it's, it's similar to like uh, to like when you see a, you know younger generation versus an older generation adopting some kind of a new technology and uh, like I just you know my uncle uh, who lives in New York came to Israel and I was like why aren't you using like Google Pay or, or Apple Pay it's like I don't know you know the, 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 that's not the, how it's done yeah they're, they're, they're gonna so like they're gonna you know get into my phone and steal my identity I was like what is it? <laughs> I was like look it's actually safer because like a credit card is just a piece of plastic just to go in here I need, you need your fingerprint and, and it's not as, as easy to, it's like, but you know, it's like that, but, but like a 20 year old is not going to even think for one split of a second about they probably don't want the plastic at all. Like they don't have it it's somewhere in their home or something. So yeah. I think it's a little bit like that. I think at the end of the, but the same degree, right? You, you need to. I think to gain trust in anything, it's not necessarily a question of AI, it's a question of trust. So mm. in order to trust something, I think you need to sample it. That's that's my, so I come from like, a, you know, an industrial engineering background. And there's a field in methods engineering called work sampling. So in order to get a picture of reality, if you sample something, mm. uh, then it gives you, and after, after a certain amount of samples, you have statistical credibility of a certain view of the world, right? So I think everything that I do and everything I see people in Optimus doing our executives, like when somebody, in order to master something, you need to get into the details. You need to you need to dig deep, deep, right? You need to open the hood, look at the engine, look at the wiring, you know, touch it, make sure it's not loose. And once you do that, you gain the trust, right? So if if you have a process that's that's running with AI, right, experience it for yourself, right? So mm -hmm. uh, let's say 
have a few mock users who are not real users, have them experience it like they're from the company, let them see what campaigns they get. Yeah. Let's see, let's see how it looks like on the other end, right? Let's experience it. Go into the database and make a few queries and see what actually is happening in, in reality. When you do that, you can gain the trust, right? You can understand what it does. Then if you want to get continuous trust, build a few monitors. So mm -hmm. get a monitor that like sends you a message if something go above this value. Right? Mm -hmm. So with 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 basically looking in looking deep in, having some monitors, getting acquainted with the data, do some walk sampling, do like this mystery shopper type of a thing for your own service. Yeah. That's gonna cover you. I mean, there's a reason so many technology companies offer those free trials, the personalized demos where they ask you for some of your data so they can actually show you how it really works in your own instance. Right, right. And and uh, and I think, and but, but I do think, yes, it is important. So many things that you're going to buy are probably going to be buggy and they may not work and they may not do what they say they do. So just, yeah, just, just kind of like experience it. Yeah. Test it. Don't be afraid to look deep into the data, see how it works for you, and then you can have the trust. Definitely. All right, Pini, do you have any real life examples or success stories that highlight the impact of Optimove's AI powered marketing platform on your clients' customer engagement and business growth? Yeah, for sure. So uh, we see kind of like what, when our clients are really successful with us, right? And, and when that magic happens, uh, it's usually a combination of a few things. But mm -hmm. when it happens, what we see is number one, we see, first of all, we see a, transform, a cultural transformation. Sure. We see the marketing team becoming a much more data driven. We see them mm -hmm. becoming kind of like a piece of experimentation. And we see them being completely free to have new ideas and implement them in, in minutes or hours versus weeks or months. Um, and, and and ultimately, what's happening is when you start to delight your customers at scale and where you start to provide this personalized experience at scale, it, it only happens when you do it at scale. When you have a one-off person here and there, it doesn't really work. You need to have kind of like, we call it from tens to hundreds of segments. So sure. you go from tens to hundreds of segments and you can manage that at scale. And, and, and that's what Optimook does. It enables you to do that. When that happens, you can see that the way we like to measure it is, is we, we, we call it like, what's the CRM marketing contribution? So if there's a business that, that's doing a hundred million a year and we can, we can attribute 10 million of that hundred million to CRM marketing, mm -hmm. we call it 10% CRM marketing contribution. So, and the way we can do that is because everything we measure, we measure based on incrementality. So I can come in and say to a brand, CRM marketing this year did $30 million. And then they can see what portion is that of their overall business. Now that's not only optimal, right? That's mm -hmm. optimal, but it's also of course the CRM team and the design team and the merchandising team that created the promos and like, this, it's, but it, we're just able to measure the impact. And of course, you guys were delivering the, the great uh, direct mails, which, which can be one of the most impactful channels, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's leveraging the combination of the channels and the intelligence and all of those things together. We can measure that uplift. We can measure that incremental value. Mm -hmm. and, and when it's really good, it could be up to thirty percent of of a business of a business's revenue. Oh, I so when CRM that. marketing it's at its best, it could be thirty percent that you can measure. And of course, don't forget about what it does to the brand, which is unmeasurable. So when customers yep. are so happy when they're getting those personalized experiences, well, that just goes back to customer retention. If you're keeping customers happy, they're going to stay with you longer. <laughs> and they're going to tell the friends and then it becomes an acquisition channel. Yep. Oh, we okay. have talked about that plenty of how to use customer retention campaigns as kind of a dual campaign in customer acquisition. The uh, refer a friend, the fr friends and family discounts. <laughs> so, so you get like, a, so that's really great. 
All right. So we've kind of talked about the challenges around AI, but let's talk about the benefits. Like what are some considerations that marketers should keep in mind when incorporating AI into their marketing strategies? Or what benefits should they really be looking for to pay off with that AI? Well, yeah, I think I think we covered most of those things along the way, you know, with different uh, conversation topics. But I think again, in general, it's like getting more insights from your data, getting those insights in an easier fashion, in a more digestible, palatable fashion, mm -hmm. and helping you with copy. You know, yeah. finding winning copy, finding winning images. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. Everything is is you know the, this whole process of test and learn, yeah. Which if you can do it, um, you know if you can do it at scale, again it creates, it just becomes a different culture. And I think today it's very clear that like test and learn is um, is really is really a big part of winning companies. So for me, kind of like being Israeli, there's a very I can I can share something cool with you. So. In Israel, in the army, the mm -hmm. we always say kind of like the best will become the, the Air Force pilots, right? So the Air Force pilots are like, um, it's like a, a really strong brand, right? Of, yeah. of the, I'm, I'm probably in the U.S. as well, Top Gun, stuff like that. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so like, but for us, like the Top Gun is really, it, it's really big, right? And it's very famous, their culture of, the, of like incident reports, and uh, and basically, you know, going back on everything they do and learning from their mistakes. And of mm -hmm. course, it sounds very natural today. You know, people know about it. Most execs, if something bad happens, they're going to ask for an incident report. But every Air Force pilot that I talk to, they mm -hmm. always talk about how this was monumental in shaping them and shaping their style as leaders, as managers, as people. Is this notion, notion of constant improvement, constant mm. learning, um, this 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 idea of, of test and learn, right? Always, yeah. always, always. It's a huge part of who they are. And they brought it to the, the Israeli business culture. And I'm sure when I always when I engage with American companies, you you can very vividly see that this is a big part of the culture, the test and learn. AI yeah. supercharges that. Right. That's what it does. It supercharges that as well. Yeah. And I think that just brings us back really nicely. You know, we've been talking about using AI to reach out to your customers. We're all about telling stories. And I mean, stories at the end of the day are all about transformation and change. And that testing and learning leans right into that. Like you are going to get left behind if your company does not adapt and take advantage of these new technologies to just improve what humans have already done before. So we've already had the creative minds think of these campaigns. Okay, now how can we optimize them without spending our time manually analyzing that data? Exactly, because, because in many cases we don't know, right? We The reason we need optimization and testing is because, you know, even the smartest people get it wrong in many times. That's the bottom line, right? I can, uh, you know, I can tell you that like when I was younger, you know, being kind of like a, you know, a, a young, cocky individual that just kind of like left university. I was, you know, I was, I was certain of a lot of things. And, you know, my experience taught me that like sometimes I had a really strong conviction about something it turned out to be completely wrong because, you know, re reality is stronger than us, right? So the testing mentality is just being open enough to, to have those ideas. Well, let's see which one sticks, right? Yeah. So that works, that works well. Perfect. All right, Pini, I have to ask, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share? Or is there anything that we didn't get to today as it concerns AI and marketing? And maybe you can you can basically edit out the fact that I said that I was a young cocky individual. <laughs> <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> that would be my final thought. Be, no, I'm just, I'm just kidding. No, I think I think we're able to cover a lot and uh, and uh, you know talk about this very interesting and riveting space. So thank you so much for having me and um, let's see how it plays out. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us. And to our listeners, thank you for joining us for Mixers and Marketing. 
Be sure to learn about more. Be sure to learn more about Optimove at optimove.com. And if you want to dive deeper into the topic of marketing automation and AI, particularly in the direct mail marketing space, please visit lobdemo.co backslash direct mail AI. That's lobdemo.co backslash direct mail AI. Direct mail AI is one word. As always, you can browse our library of episodes over at lobdemo.co backslash lobcast. Otherwise, thanks for listening. And that's all, folks.